Hi, folks. Today, um, what we will be going, this slide really covers what we'll be talking about and some learning objectives for today. So we're going to talk about a very, very high level overview of um, looking at addictive disorders. Um, as an attendee, you will gain some foundational understanding of addictive disorders and how clients that you might be working with could be affected um, and potentially, well, hopefully a little bit of what you could do with that. Um, so specific learning objectives for today include um, participants understanding the prevalence rates of addictive disorders in the United States, really just laying, um, laying the land for us to understand what does this look like. I'm also understanding some common models of etiology of addictive disorders, um, and then talking a little bit about evidence-based treatments for these. Um, I just really want to emphasize that this is an introductory presentation with a broad level information. I know um, some folks on the participant list have been um, studying and working in this area for a significant amount of time. Um, and for those that are very new to this, this will help lay a foundation for hopefully what you'll be able to build on from this. I'll provide a little bit more context for you to understand who I am. I think that's always really important as an attendee um, to understand who the person is and how they are potentially qualified to lead a training in this. Um, my name is Dr. Morrow, Dr. Regina Morrow. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I, although I work for Palo Alto, I do not live in Palo Alto, California. I live in Bellingham, Washington, which is just north of Seattle, very close to the Canadian border. Um, I do have a PhD from UNC Charlotte in counseling. And um, while I was earning my PhD, I also earned a graduate certificate in substance abuse counseling. Um, I was trained um, in the counseling profession um, in KCRAP accredited programs. So my master's degree is in community counseling. And then my BA is in sociology from the University of Albany. Um, that training in sociology really um, leads into a lot of my understanding of etiology of addiction, which we'll share. Um, I'll share in a little while. Um, I also have, do hold a variety of licenses across the country as a professional counselor and as an addiction specialist, um, which really um, is my, my identity is as a professional counselor who specializes in addiction, um, and that's my clinical work. So uh, speaking of clinical work, that's not on this slide, but I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, I have trained, um, a largely trained in a lot of integrated care settings, um, integrated um, with medical, medical world with behavioral health. So that was in a family residency program, as well as working in a level one trauma center. Um, so at the trauma center, I did what is known as SBIRT. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but it stands for, it's S-B-I-R-T. It stands for screening brief intervention and referral to treatment. And this was with individuals who were hospitalized as a result of their um, alcohol and or drug use. Um, so they sustained uh, level one injuries, uh, level one trauma, there's a scale associated with traumatic injuries. Um, so they sustained these injuries and were hospitalized. And I, along with the team um, that I was a part of, would go in and um, conduct a screening. And then if it, would, if it was warrant or indicated a brief intervention and potentially a uh, referral to treatment. Um, so that was a lot of my work um, doing brief counseling with individuals across the entirety of the addiction spectrum. Um, and since then I have worked in other clinical settings um, and helping individuals, whether that is um, coming into counseling in my private practice who are struggling with addiction or struggling or um, in recovery and wanting support with that, um, as well as working in community clinics and supervising individuals and helping train on how we can spot addiction and what we can do if that is the case. So a variety of different experiences um, that have led me to where I am currently um, in my professional future. I do want to talk some kind of laying a couple of um, agreements as we're moving forward today. And um, but that is about what our focus will be as well as language that you will hear me um, utilize. So it will likely not come as a surprise to any of you to learn that addiction is highly stigmatized in our world. You can simply turn on your local news station or read a newspaper and will often find disparaging remarks about individuals that struggle with addiction. One way we can help fight this stigma is by, by being conscientious about the language that we are using. So you'll see two recommendations here on this slide. The first being to use person first language and also the second to be using professional terminology. 
An example of person first language is saying an individual struggling with a substance use disorder. And an example of using professional language um, is something along the lines of, let's say, um, if you are using urine drug screens, it's to say that the urine drug screen indicated the presence of amphetamines. Um, I think you can, there's some, this article by Zikirska et al. Um, does offer some other insights into non-person first language and non-professional terminology. So I encourage you to read through that and understand um, just what we, what, how we might be contributing to causing harm or perpetuating stigma. These two suggestions are thinking uh, more broadly. However, we can make modifications based upon the individual sitting in front of us. Once a specific client has identified a certain way that they want to be um, identified as, we do want to honor their personal language. And this is a recommendation that comes from Dr. Jerry Miller, um, who has written extensively on addiction counseling um, and she's written extensively, but also has uh, decades of experience of doing this. It's important to, again, honor their personal choice of the language they, they want to be using, even when it might be something that we disagree with. Um, and we can be transparent about that in a conversation with those clients. Another piece I wanted to comment on today is that we'll, we will be largely focusing on substance use disorders, but that doesn't limit this information to being relevant only with individuals with this type of addiction. We do know that individuals um, seek our services as counselors um, for behavioral addictions, and these might also co-occur with substance addictions. Um, I am just focusing in on substance addiction here today due to um, the limited time that we have to spend together. And also each of the topics that we will be talking about today could be their own training. I and mean, this goes back to what we talked about in the beginning about this being a very broad training overall. When I think about conducting trainings on addiction, it's always really important to me that we start out exploring prevalence rates. I know that it might seem a little boring to some, but these really help me understand how big of an issue this is. I will share some information today about addiction usage and disorders at the national level, and I encourage you to explore the more nuanced rates for your local and regional areas um, following today's session. The NSDUH, which is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, is a yearly survey that's published by SAMHSA, and it is my go-to source for current information. They also publish some state-level behavioral health reports known as barometers. Um, at, there's a link here on this slide, so you should um, have a copy of the slides that are in the chat. Um, this, you'll be able to access those links. Uh, this slide also provides information on the types of data the survey collects, and the ones that we are going to focus in are these four areas today. Uh, although the report has many other foci or many other areas in uh, the document. Um, so this is something that is uh, freely accessible uh, that you can find. Um, I typically, whenever preparing these new ones, I will know whether a new one has been released for the previous year. So the what we the prevalence rates that I will be talking about today, this was published in 2023. Um, however, this is about the year 2022 in our country. So to dive right in, we the first statistics are about the use of substances in our country. These are about how many individuals in the United States, ages 12 and older, who use these substances in the past month. This use is not measured beyond just the report of using. So it's not quantity, anything like that. It's more just how they use. So an individual might show up here by having consumed one uh, drink containing alcohol or 25 or more drinks in the month. As you can see from this chart, the most common substance used in the US is alcohol with over 137.4 million folks identifying past month use. Um, tobacco and nicotine vaping are following. You'll know a difference in the colors here and I am making an assumption based upon um, my knowledge of addiction because it's not detailed explicitly in the report or the statistical definition file they have. Um, but my assumption is that the difference is between legal and illegal substances. It's 
important though that we think about that it can vary depending on age so just because alcohol is uh, highlighted here as a light blue that doesn't mean that that is uh, legal for everyone in this report um, because remember this is for individuals 12 and older and also it's different based upon jurisdictions in some um, situations here so you'll see that there are 42.3 million reported uh, marijuana users in the past month but we also know that the legality of marijuana or cannabis changes based upon jurisdictions. At the federal level, it is uh, still um, illegal. But to summarize here on this chart, the four top substances that are being used in our country by folks over the age of 11 are alcohol, tobacco, um, vaping nicotine, and cannabis. That's not to say they're the only ones, but those are the top four. So um, quite a few number of users of substances in our society. Um, the other thing just to highlight here is it's not, each category is not exclusive. Um, so individuals can also, they might be in the alcohol users, but they could also be in the methamphetamine use category. So we have um, individuals that may be using multiple substances throughout uh, the past month. This next slide are about those who have initiated use in the past year. You'll see that nicotine vaping tops the chart with over 6 million folks engaging in vaping nicotine for the first time. This is followed by alcohol, then cannabis, cigars, and hallucinogens and cigarettes being equal at 1.4 million. I recently read a report the other day about uh, the rise in poison control numbers being reported due to hallucinogens, hallucinogen consumption. And due to the rise in popularity of these substances, I can only surmise that might continue to grow when these are not being utilized in appropriate settings. Um, and a lot of that does have to do with the popularity, um, well, Michael Pollan's book, um, How to Change Your Mind, certainly, and then the Netflix special. There's been a lot of attention given to hallucinogens, um, psychedelics, um, and their healing properties that exist. We are learning much more about what the research suggests about that, um, and we have a lot more to go um, from understanding the role of psychedelics. Um, but I just find it fascinating to know that these are a growing, these are growing in popularity um, beyond, well, they're growing in popularity. Certainly as someone who is working in this, I'm aware and um, I'm aware of the initiation of use, that this is something that is continuously growing in our society. And I want to understand um, how individuals are being affected by that. So here, um, we'll transition to looking at disordered use of substances. So the previous two slides helped us understand who is using and who's starting using, but this slide gets more into the specifics of, sub of substance use disorders. So we'll talk in a little bit about what the criteria are for diagnosis according to the DSM-5 texturized version. But um, here you'll note that 17.3% of individuals ages 12 and older in our society have struggled with a substance use disorder in the past year as reported in 2022. The most common is, this is a broad level substance use disorder at 29 million um, individuals followed closely by um, drug use disorders specifically. And I'm sorry, I said uh, substance use disorder, the largest, but I meant alcohol use disorder. Um, and that's followed by drug use disorders. Again, similar to the slide about use or initiation about use, these are not mutually exclusive. So one individual may appear in multiple categories if they have co-occurring substance use disorders. So quite a few of, of large amount of individuals in our society. I'm not sure about the, um, my math might not be right exactly, but it's about one in six um, individuals are struggling with a substance use disorder. The previous slide told us about those with the diagnosable disorders, and this slide focuses in on who is getting treatment. So if you remember, there were approximately 48 million folks who met criteria for a substance use disorder. However, from this slide that we will, you'll see that only 13.1 million of those individuals sought treatment, which is roughly 27%. So while that's great for that 27%, a little over one in four, that means that three out of four folks did not seek treatment. This is something that is known as the treatment gap, 
And there have been a lot of efforts uh, to seeking to close this gap, so to help get individuals. Um, one that I had mentioned previously um, was working on, well, is ESPERT, and that's um, what I had worked on a treatment and ESPERT team. So ESPERT, again, is screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. And this is an evidence-based practice that largely uh, began in medical settings where medical professionals were trained on how to screen for substance use disorders, provide a brief intervention if it was indicated, and refer that those folks to treatment if they needed. There are a wide variety of these programs across our country, and folks who are interested in learning more about ESPERT um, can do so via SAMHSA's website. So SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Sur Mental Health Services Administration, um, and there are, there's a ton of information about ESPERT being in, um, infused in different settings, um, largely medical settings, but has expanded significantly since then. That effort specifically, so ESPERT initiatives, are thinking about how we can close the treatment gap that exists. You'll also note here that there are a variety of different settings that treat substance use disorders. We'll talk a little bit about the different levels of care, which is also known as the continuum of care in substance use disorder treatment. The last area of focus I did um, want to mention uh, is the opioid epidemic. So um, there, I think I, I'm assuming, is, isn't a surprise to anybody um, who is here today who has a concern about individuals in our world. Um, which most mental health professionals do and students who are training for that. Um, but we are certainly in this opioid epidemic and we have been for a number of years. This slide highlights that there have really been these three waves of opioid overdose deaths, opioid overdose deaths. The first wave um, starting in the 90s um, really related to the rise in prescription opioid overdose deaths. Um, there have been a lot of, uh, I forget the docudrama series, I think is the term um, that captures that, but there's been a lot of those on uh, Netflix um, or I guess other streaming platforms. I know um, I did watch, I think it was called Painkiller, um, the one about Purdue Pharma, um, largely being attributed to a lot of, um, well, a lot of the history associated with how um, the, opioid, the opioid epidemic really um, initiated. The wave two is um, starting in 2010, and this is where there was a rise in heroin overdose deaths. And wave three um, started in 2013, where there was a notable rise in synthetic opioid overdose deaths, um, largely attributed to fentanyl. So in 2021, there were 106,699 drug overdose deaths in the U.S., since 1999, we have lost more than 1 million people as a result of drug overdose. In 2021, um, opioids were involved in over 75% of overdose deaths. And um, a significant increase from 21, or 2020 to 2021, there was a 37% increase um, in psychostimulant-involved overdose deaths. And then also, in the past few years, many of you have likely heard about the rise and harm of a drug called xylazine, which is a tranquilizer used by veterinarians, no approved use um, medically in humans. Um, and this is a very dangerous drug, and it's particularly dangerous in combination with opioids. So this is something that is certainly affecting not only the individuals who are losing their lives to overdose, and, but to the families and friends and systems that are affected by these individuals. I do wanna take a moment here to acknowledge those that have lost their lives due to the opioid epidemic. So we will pause in silent reflection for a minute at this time.
Hey, thank you all. I know that's um, a tiny, tiny thing that we are doing, um, but I know that there are likely many folks who are on this call today who have been affected by this, um, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that. So we will move along in this presentation uh, to talk a little bit about etiology. So according to a quick Google search, um, the definition of etiology is the cause, set of causes, or manner of causation of, of a disease or condition. So referring to substance use disorders, etiology is what we consider when we think about contributing factors or as mental health professionals, how we conceptualize the case we are working on. It would be so nice if this was very clear cut um, however, it is not. And that's why I have chosen this quote by Scott Peck, which emphasizes the complexity associated with the understanding, with understanding the etiology of addiction. The quote reads, abandon the urge to simplify everything, to look for formulas and easy answers, and begin to think multidimensionally, to glory in the mystery and paradoxes of life not to be dismayed by the multitude of causes and consequences that are inherent in each experience, but to appreciate the fact that life is complex. I find this particularly helpful to keep in mind when working with all clients, um, but particularly those struggling with addiction, because it is complex and multidimensional. And when we try to narrow down to one thing, we are missing out on the uniqueness of that individual. So as an addiction professional and someone who has trained addiction counselors and written um, in this area, I often have uh, talked with family members or friends who ask me, but why does this keep happening? Why are we in an opioid epidemic? Why, why, why? And my answer is always like many counseling or mental health uh, faculty members is it really depends. It depends on the individual and the factors um, that they bring to the table um, or how they are affected. So as a reminder, when we are talking about these ideological frameworks that I will mention, I do think it's important that we want to honor uh, the multi-dimensions multi that um, help us understand an individual sitting across from us, which is largely what the biopsychosocial model does for us, which we will um, talk about in English. So this is um, comes uh, directly from Dr. Jerry Miller um, in one of her, I think it's the fourth or fifth edition of uh, the textbook Language of Addiction Counseling. Um, I really, I do recommend that reading for folks who are interested in learning more about addiction. Um, and these are the sum of the ideological frameworks for understanding addiction. So while it's important that we consider these multiple dimensions, we'll get to that down um, with the biopsychosocial. But there has been a lot of these writings done on understanding the etiology. So we'll start up top, and this has really evolved, uh, beginning with the moral model, moving towards the biopsychosocial model. Um, but the moral model suggests that it is a moral weakness or flaw within the individual that has caused their addiction. So I really cringe when I say this. Um, I don't want to be contributing to perpetuating um, this model. Um, but it's also really important for us to talk about this because the moral model still has a strong hold in our society. It's hard to imagine the stigma of addiction would be as strong without the moral model leading the way. So it's, um, you, I, I had mentioned previously about the stigma and just um, watching the news, reading a newspaper, um, also watching television, like TV shows in which there is um, an individual who's struggling with addiction, you'll see the moral model pop up in these domains. Um, so while I think professionally we have done a lot of work moving away from the moral model, this has not always, this hasn't translated to our society as a whole, but this still has a very firm rooting. You'll then see a shift towards conceptualizing addiction from a psychological standpoint, whether that's from um, first looking about um, the unconscious conflicts from the psychodynamic perspective, um, towards learning about addiction, conceptualizing it as um, behavior learning theory, um, that there are reinforcers in the environment that contribute to one's use. We then moved into a sociological framework, which examines social forces and context 
And for me, someone who graduated with an undergraduate degree in sociology, I find myself pulled into this domain frequently. The second to last on this slide is that of the disease model, which suggests that addiction is a brain disease which progresses over time. This model certainly combats the moral model by highlighting the role of biology and specifically about the brain circuitry involved in the addiction cycle. We sadly won't go into the specifics of that today, but for those that are interested, there was a great article written in 2016 by Krug and Volko, which um, is titled Neurobiology of Addiction and Neurocircuitry Analysis. And that is available um, via PubMed. Um, you can get that via Google Scholar. And that includes some really helpful graphics for understanding brain circuitry involved in this and um, the cycle of addiction. The disease model has contributed significantly to help reduce some of the harm caused by the moral model as it's definitely less stigmatizing. But there are critiques of this model, largely centered on the limits of it not taking into account other factors that can, that can contribute to substance use disorders. And that brings us to the biopsychosocial model of addiction. This suggests that there are biological, psychological, and sociological factors that are interacting and contributing to the continuation of this disorder. As a mental health counselor, I've largely been influenced by the writing of George Engel, who in 1977 first wrote about the biosocial, biopsychosocial model as it pertains to medicine. As a graduate student, early on in my training, I was asked to do a lot of theoretical conceptualizations of my clients and practicum and internship. And I often struggled with applying the psychological theories to the individuals that I was working with. Um, I had a supervisor who showed me Engel's writing, and it was like a big light bulb went on for me. Um, it's not to say that the theories we covered were not helpful, um, but I found that they were, well, they are largely focused on the psychological domain. And to me, that just didn't feel sufficient enough for the individuals that I was working with. So for me, integrating biological factors with sociological factors has helped me feel as though I can understand more about the uniqueness of the individual sitting in front of me. And I'll speak a little bit more about this biopsycho um, social model, which um, to me is uh, where I conceptualize addiction. It's also where I conceptualize um, uh, my, the work I do with all of my clients, regardless of if I'm focusing in on substance use disorders or not. Um, but when we are talking about biology, we are talking about um, heredity, genetics, uh, neurobiological factors, and also the age of initiation. So we know that there are multiple genes and neural networks that are implicated in addiction. We also um, know that there is there's some genetic liability that some individuals hold, which is their, the variability in one's genetic risk for addiction. We also know that the age of initiation of use matters. So substance use on the developing brain can have a more rapid impact. There was a really great series, I think it was really great, um, done um, by Sanjay Gupta, and it's called Weed, in which he explores um, medical marijuana and the system of medical marijuana. And this was actually um, done a number of years ago. I'm not remembering exactly, but it was um, somewhere from 2013 to 2016, I believe, um, in which this was released um, by CNN. And it really goes into why I especially love this is it does talk about some of the benefits that individuals have found um, from cannabis use, but very specifically targets in on the harms associated with use on the developing brain. And that information has been really helpful for me, um, as well as for students and supervisees that I have been working on. So I believe that you can find that on YouTube. Um, I, I know it's called Weed, but I forget there's a, sub, a subtitle, but you can um, find that by Googling Sanjay Gupta Weed. Um, we also know from a biological standpoint about neuroadaptation, so that our brains change as a result of experiences. So um, our repeated use of substances can lead to these neuroadaptations in the brain. It's also really good news for us about um, brains can, we can mold them. Um, so we can learn new ways, we can build new neural pathways um, with individuals who are in treatment. The psychological domain for many of us is the domain that we are 
um, we are trained a lot in as mental health professionals. So this encompasses mental health concerns or disorders, trauma history, personality traits, um, adverse experiences, and stress. Um, so the ways in which we can understand those psychological factors. And then the so social, sorry, uh, sociological, but social uh, factors are the environment, um, exposure, and modeling that occurs for those individuals. So I like to think about um, the biopsychosocial model. When I think about with clients, it's kind of like a bar. Here I have a Venn diagram, um, which I think is really helpful, but also thinking about like a bar chart. So for some folks, we're gonna be really high on the biological domain. And maybe we won't be as high in psychological, sociological. Other folks, we're going to have very high in the psychological domain, especially potentially with individuals with a trauma history, um, and maybe not as high in the other ones. Maybe um, biologically, the biological domain is fairly high because the addictive cycle has been set in the brain circuitry, uh, but maybe the sociological factor isn't as much, although that's hard to imagine that um, with a trauma history. So um, I like to think about the individual sitting in front of me, how do these different domains how could these show up in that individual to then be where they are um, at this moment in time? It helps me have, um, I guess it, it helps me have some container for the thinking complexity is it's not just, if we go back to that slide from Scott Peck about thinking multidimensionally, it's not just like, oh, I just can't conceptualize it. There's too many things involved in the addictive process for this one individual. It's being able to say like, well, what are the biological factors for this person? What are the psychological factors? And then are, what are the social factors? So it really helps provide a container for me, um, for my thinking complexity, because I, can, I think we could get very lost when we are, do allow ourselves to think so broadly. Um, this just helps uh, provide a container for that. So on this next slide, um, I want to highlight this definition of addiction that comes from the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And this reads as um, addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. So people with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. Prevention efforts and treatment approaches for addiction are gen generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases. I really do believe, and I know um, some other individuals who, who work in um, addiction or do addiction education, um, appreciate the biopsychosocial model being reflected in this definition. So it's really captured in a lot of the writing that um, ACM does here. So at this point, um, we, I hope, have provided a helpful overview about what addiction looks like in our country by highlighting prevalence rates and providing some basic understanding of etiological frameworks. So we'll now shift to exploring what addiction counseling looks like by first starting to by first talking through uh, the competencies associated with providing addiction education. So these um, this are what's known as the practice dimensions. Uh, this was published by SAMHSA. Um, it's a treatment assistance publication. These are known as TAPS. Um, this is specifically TAP twenty one. Um, I have it right here. Oh, you can't see because I have my filter on, but I actually have the printed book of this, which I feel really fortunate to have. Um, you can find this on SAMHSA's website as a downloadable PDF, um, but it's a fairly comprehensive, I think it's over 200, if not, yeah, over 200 pages that really um, details, uh, details out um, the competencies associated with providing addiction counseling. You can see that providing addiction counseling services is complex, just like understanding addiction is. There's these multiple domains of services that we can provide. I won't be exploring each of these today, but I will cover some information about the clinical evaluation domain. Um, we'll also explore the service coordination domain by highlighting the continuum of care and the different levels of care that exist. 
um, and we'll talk about counseling by exploring some treatment philosophies and talk briefly about client, family, and community education domain when we talk about peer support group settings. So screening and assessment, and this falls in the, um, the clinical evaluation domain. Screening is, uh, we can think about screening as being an initial exploration. Um, and as, if we do a screening with a client and um, it, it has, it, it will not say, yes, this person has a substance use disorder or not. It really provides us information that can help guide where we go from that. Um, I'll go through a couple different screenings today. Um, so one, one that you is an acronym that you can commit to memory to be able to pull on. The other um, aspect of clinical evaluation is the assessment process. So this is a thorough evaluation, which leads um, to an identification of a diagnosis or the absence of a diagnosis. I do want to highlight here that um, sometimes the assessment process is dictated by a local jurisdiction. Um, so there are some like uh, living in different, I've lived and worked as a counselor in quite a few different states in this country. Um, and the this, this states can require different um, assessments for the individuals to go through um, in order for um, diagnosis process. The University of Washington um, has an institute, it's the Addictions Drug and Alcohol Institute, and they have so much information on their website, but one of these is a incredible repository of screening and assessment tools. I won't click on this link, but if you do, um, once you download those, uh, once you download the slides, you'll be able to click on that link or just Google the University of Washington ADAI repository of uh, tools, and it will take you to this website and where you can search. So you can search. I think there's a few different functions where you can search for either screening tools only. Um, assessment tools only, and you can search for adolescents or adults, um, and it will pull up a list, um, and the list will either link, it will provide um, the link to the assessment, or it will provide, provide the information about how to obtain the assessment. So not all of them are um, available for free, um, but it will indicate that on the website. They also have, I believe it's like a star that indicates that there is a significant body of research supporting the use of um, said assessment um, or screening tool. So that is really for me one of, um, I love uh, training students to understand how they can utilize that database, um, especially when it's when something emerges in clinical work to be able to go to that and pull on that. So that is um, hopefully just a helpful resource for your futures. So I want to talk through um, three different assessment, or three different screening tools. Um, the first is the CAGE screening tool. This was developed in uh, the early 80s by Ewing. And this is an acronym that you can commit to memory in order to quickly screen a patient. So the C stands for cut down. So the question is, have you felt the need to cut down on your drinking? The A stands for annoyed. So do you feel annoyed by people complaining about your drinking? The G is about guilt feelings, and it's do you ever feel guilty about your drinking? And the E is do you ever drink an eye opener in the morning to relieve the shakes? So you'll see this is largely focused on alcohol consumption, um, but there is a, I believe it's called the cage aid, which is has been modified to be about drug use. So according to uh, this, any yes that a client um, indicates is uh, equal to one point. If there are two or more, that means it is clinically significant, but all that really means is that a further assessment is necessary for this person. Why I think this can be really helpful um, to commit to memory is because sometimes you won't be prepared with a further, um, like a more advanced screening tool. I know for me um, in my private practice, I have had a client before say, you know, um, I just feel like I'm drinking a little bit too much. And I'll say, well, um, can, we, can we talk about that a little bit more? Um, I, or I do have some questions which will maybe help us under, like indicate whether or not we need to do more, um, look, like look into this a little bit more. And I can quickly pull this tool out. And one thing I will say as a mental health counselor, I don't love about this tool is they are closed-ended questions. 
Um, but I do know that that has to do a lot with the psychometrics associated with how we are asking that. So uh, making sure that we are following that. Um, so again, this I think is helpful to just help me understand, is there more information that I need to gather and how can I be strategic about doing that? Um, so just committing the cage to memory can be helpful. The next screening tool is um, one that I, this is the screening tool that we used in the hospital when I was part of the expert team. Um, so I have done, I don't even, I would love to know how many times I have administered the audit, um, but it it's, uh, it's incredibly well-researched. This was uh, published by the World Health Organization in 2001, um, and since then has been um, translated into a, uh, over 50 languages. You can find that those available. Um, this link here again, which is in the slides, will take you to um, a lot of that, that um, website that has these translated versions available. But what the audit is, is it's um, the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. And it's 10 items that are used to explore an individual's alcohol use. This is broken up into questions about consumption, um, specific drinking behaviors, and then alcohol-related consequences. It has been modified over time. Um, so the audit C is the first three questions of um, the, uh, the audit. It's all about the consumption questions. So those uh, kinds of questions are how often do you have a drink containing alcohol? Um, or how often do you have six or more drinks on um, one occasion? Uh, questions about drinking behaviors include how often during the last year have you failed to do what was more normally expected of you because of drinking? Or um, how often in the last year have you found that you were not able to stop drinking once you had started? And then alcohol-related consequences. Um, so thinking about injury. Um, so how often have, or have, have you or someone else ever been injured as a result of your drinking? Or has a relative, friend, doctor, or other healthcare worker been concerned about your drinking and suggested you cut down? I'm realizing I did not include the scoring here. Um, however, a score of zero to seven, according to the audit um, manual, is indicated as low risk. So an individual um, then would not be facing an individual from with a score of zero to seven, zero is an individual that has no risk because they likely are not consuming alcohol. A score of one, um, one to seven indicates low risk so that there are low biological, psychological and sociological um, risks or consequences associated with that. A score of eight to 15 is that there is some risk associated in those different domains. So we would wanna explore um, how the individual's use patterns um, explore if there are ways for them to cut down. A score of 16 to 19 indicates that there is likely, um, we need more information for that individual, but a score some, from 20 to 40, according to the manual, is that that individual does need to be referred for um, more thorough assessment. I know that is a large, um, a large number, like 20 to 40. Um, what I like to remind uh, folks about is that substance use disorders exist on a spectrum. Um, so a score of 20, 21 potentially could um, correlate to a mild use disorder, where a score of uh, 35 to 40 might correlate with more severe use disorder. Um, but that is what the assessment will, um, the assessment process will help us learn more about. Um, I, this is a freely available um, tool that you can use. There are different versions available, whether that's the interview version or the self-report version for a client to do on their own. I have um, only ever done the interview version. I find that that's really important for um, who I am as a clinician to be able to um, work with clients through this process and ask those questions um, and remembering to use my counseling skills as I'm going through that. So potentially there is a question here about guilt or remorse. Um, it, it says like, how often during the past year have you had a feeling of guilt or remorse after drinking? And a client will likely say like, oh, that maybe has happened a couple of times. There was this one time such and such, and I can use my skills of reflecting um, and then focusing to say like, that sounds like something maybe we could talk about in the future. I do have to um, ask a few more questions on this. So not forgetting that not being a robot, remembering that I am a clinician and I can infuse my counseling skills in this process. 
The last um, screening tool that I wanted to highlight he here is the DAST-10, which was developed in the early 80s. Um, and this explores drug use in the past 12 months. Um, this excludes alcohol and tobacco. So there's 10 items, um, some type of questions that are included on this. Again, they're closed ended questions, but have you used drugs other than those required for medical reasons? Or have you um, ever, have you had blackouts or flashbacks or results of drug use? Um, or have you neglected your family because of the use of drugs? Um, going through this, there, you know, um, there's a scoring on that. I believe some of the items are reverse scored. So you want to take a look on um, that link on this, which again is in the slides. You'll be able to click that link. It will um, take you to the screening tool and it will go through the scoring procedures. But similar to the audit, there's these range of scores. Uh, so a zero indicates there's no problems. One to two indicates that there's a low level um, that we need to monitor these individuals and rescreen them later on. A two to five is a moderate level of uh, risk or concern that we want to investigate further. A six to eight is a substantial level and nine to 10 is severe. And for both of those levels, we would wanna move um, towards an intensive assessment. Um, I am not going to be covering intensive assessments, um, largely due to the variability of the assessments that you may be exposed to um, at your facility if you are working in addiction treatment um, because of how often that is um, guided by um, like guided by uh, uh, policies um, which indicate which assessments are required. You can learn more about um, specific assessments associated for exploring addiction or yeah, yeah, exploring addiction um, at the that link that I had mentioned earlier from the University of Washington. Um, and there are trainings that um, exist to help individual trainings that exist to train you on doing these more thorough assessments. Um, so that is something that um, I encourage you to explore or ask in your local community which assessments um, are required to understand what you may um, be doing with that. So after screening and assessment, we are moving into diagnosis. So um, what's important for um, folks to know here about diagnosis is that in 2013, with the publication of the DSM-5 by the APA, there were some major changes to diagnosing addictive disorders. So previously, there were two categories, and this was um, subs uh, abuse or dependence. And there was a, a big shift which moved away from a, like substance abuse and substance dependence. And now it's substance use disorders, which can be diagnosed as either mild, moderate, or severe. There was some pushback um, associated with this move to a spectrum. Um, I think some of the pushback that I had read um, at the time and since then um, was that, well, more people might be captured. Did we lower the sh threshold of individuals who are struggling with substance use disorders? I can just share from my clinical experience of working in the hospital and doing a lot of screening, a lot of screenings with folks is there are a lot of people in our world who are struggling with substance use disorders. There are also a lot of people who don't recognize the severity of their addiction. Um, and part of that is due to um, societal messaging about potential rock bottoms and seeing that that's, that's what traditional addiction looks like. There's a really great article um, that I, I, I'm, I forget the um, authors and title, so I apologize, but it's all about the TV show Intervention. Um, and how the TV show intervention was helpful on one hand, um, because it highlights and hopefully contributes to, um, it highlights it highlights addiction, it highlights the cause, the harms associated with that. It highlights how we can help individuals get into treatment. But one of the harms that the show done it had done was it was only showing severe abuse disorders. So individuals who might be struggling maybe with a mild use disorder or even risky use before they enter into the threshold of a diagnosable um, use pattern, they might look at that and say like, oh, I, I don't have an issue because I'm not, I'm not struggling like that person is struggling. So while um, it did certainly expand, um, I think expand our understanding of addiction, the new diagnosable um, or the new diagnosis process in the uh, DSM-5, 
I really do feel as though that's beneficial for our world to help people understand their unique use patterns and how that could be contributing to um, negative consequences that they are experiencing. So um, within this, there are, since there's not, there used to be abuse independence and abuse independence had similar overlapping criteria, but also separate and distinct criteria. That's not true anymore. Now there are 11 criteria um, for substance use disorders. So I won't go through all of those, this, um, all of the criteria, but um, you can find those um, in the DSM-5. Um, but some of those are if an individual is taking uh, the substance in larger amounts or for longer than they're meant to, um, the cravings and urges to use the substance, um, that they are giving up important social, occupational, or recreational activities because of the substance use, or that they are needing more of the substance to get the effect that that individual wants, which is known as tolerance. Um, the last criteria is uh, the withdrawal symptoms, which are specifically relevant to the specific substance. So different, um, different substances have different withdrawal symptoms that exist, and that is largely due to the effect of the symptom, or I'm sorry, that's due to the effect of the the substance has on the central nervous system, and that withdrawing from that um, has a similar effect biologically for the individual. Well, and the opposite effect actually that the original substance did. So what um, that means is, um, for example, alcohol is what's known as a downer. Um, so it's a the central nervous system depressant. Um, so it slows the body down biologically. The central nervous system is slowed down, but when withdrawing from alcohol, it's the inverse action. So um, the biological system is sped up. Um, so an increased heart rate, sweating, palpitations, um, those are withdrawal, symptom, withdrawal symptoms associated with um, alcohol specifically. So um, while they are, all the 11 criteria are the same, that the last one about withdrawal is specific to the um, substance of being diagnosed. And that's all detailed out in the DSM. So some important changes occurred in 2013, which has, um, those were kept with the text revised version. Um, and important for us to know as we think about diagnosing um, substance use disorders for individuals. Once an individual has been diagnosed with uh, uh, substance use disorder, we can think about treatment. Um, so the American Society of Addiction Medicine, again, ASAM, they publish a continuum of care model for treatment. Again, this is, I feel like as I'm, as I've talked through this um, talk, really thinking about all the complexity that is involved in um, addiction and working with individuals on this wide variety of addiction. Um, and that's also this complexity continues into the treatment. Um, so different ways that we intervene with individuals, or not intervene, I'm sorry, but ways that we provide care for these individuals. So this was recently um, updated, the continuum of care. Um, so this is, I, I'm just learning um, about significant changes that have happened in um, the, this continuum of care model. Um, but one of the most, uh, well, the largest change, at least from my, my exploration that I have seen, is that ASAM really acknowledges that recovery residence is a, an area that kind of, it goes across all of the levels of care. So what my, they mean by this is, I mean, there are individuals who live in communities while they are in recovery, um, whether that is like um, a halfway house um, or other types of recovery residences. And that might, they might be engaged, like they might be in a recovery residence and getting outpatient care, but that also might, they might be at level three, which is a residential in which the recovery residence is built into that treatment. So this is uh, the big shift, at least from what I know of the publication, the new publication of the continuum of care. When we think about level one, this is an outpatient level. Um, so many of us, well, I can speak for myself as a clinician, as a mental health counselor, this is what I have specialized in a lot, especially um, over the past decade is um, outpatient work um, in my private practice or in um, agencies which I have offered pro bono services, really working with an individual weekly or potentially bi-weekly um, on the treatment plan that we have. Level two this um, IOP is intensive outpatient and um, HIOP is the 
it's at a hospitalized intensive out or yeah, hospital intensive outpatient, I believe. Now I'm questioning my um, own use of that acronym. Um, but this is where individuals are, um, it's an outpatient level of care, but it's not rising to the threshold of inpatient or of residential care. Um, so one thing that is um, interesting is how these are the criteria. There's often like a number of hours per day that is associated with that. Um, so they might meet for a specific level or sorry, they may um, meet for specific hours. Um, and then if it goes above that, that's when they transition, you would transition into the next level of care. So residential um, is level three and then inpatient is level four. Often in these levels three and four, what distinguishes um, these are about how they how clients are medically monitored or managed. So if they are going through detox services um, and in levels three and four, which distinguishes that is if there are how the medical professionals are involved in that care. So in residential, that individual medical individuals are likely not on site all day, every day, um, but they have a specific requirement that they are there to help monitor individuals um, medical needs. Whereas inpatient, there's more intense monitoring um, from a like a medical standpoint. So this is a very um, quick overview about the different levels of care that exist. I think it's important for us to just remember that we as clinicians can be involved in a variety of these different levels. So we might work in an ILP program or we might work in an outpatient program, but you will have understanding of kind of what that means for the individual in terms of the services that they are receiving for that. Again, just really adding more to the complexity of what, what it means to be a substance use disorder professional. I Here, I want to highlight um, that there are different treatment philosophies. I'm only highlighting two here um, because these are the broad levels, um, but two treatment philosophies. What we want to ask is how is the etiological framework of um, understanding addiction, how is that embedded into the treatment model? So um, you'll largely find abstinence-based programs dominate across the U.S. So these are programs in which individuals, the, the treatment goal, the first treatment goal largely is helping an individual be abstinent from X um, and that the treatment plan is built around that goal of abstinence. There are also um, the other kind of, not flip side, but um, differing, um, is the idea of harm reduction. So harm reduction being abstinence is not the only goal. Maybe that's a goal for some, but we really want to be focusing on uh, reducing the harms associated with X, like the use of that substance for that individual. And let's talk through what that looks like for that one person. Um, let's talk through specific specifics about that. I'll have some more. I have another slide um, that covers specific harm reduction strategies. Um, I will own my opinion of that I am a harm reduction professional. Um, I believe that abstinence really works well for many people, but I do not believe it is the only model to help folks um, find recovery um, for what that looks like for them. So I, I really care about helping people. And from my definition of helping, it looks different based upon the person who's sitting across from me. But again, I really want to own that that is my opinion. And that's not um, everybody's opinion who works and provides services in addiction. This is a really helpful question if you are interviewing, whether that's for a clinical placement in your graduate training program or for a job after graduation, is to ask, what is the um, treatment philosophy of this agency? Help me understand what is the treatment philosophy and then how is that reflected in the services that are offered here? That way you'll know if there is an, a helpful fit between where you come from as well as what are the services being offered um, at the placement. Treatment um, evidence-based practices. I had mentioned that we would learn a little bit about this today. This really, um, this is such a huge area that we could spend literally in a training on every single type of evidence-based practice. There are, there are many of those trainings that exist out there. Um, but I did wanna highlight just a few of these 
Um, but before I do that, I do want to highlight this definition of what an evidence-based practice is from the Institute of Medicine. So um, what the Institute of Medicine says that to the, is that to the greatest extent possible, the decisions that shape the health and healthcare of Americans by patients, providers, payers, and policymakers alike will be grounded on reliable evidence base, will account appropriately for individual variation in patient needs, and will support the generation of new insights and clinical effectiveness. So it is certainly important um, that we are operating from an evidence-based, we are operating from an evidence base when we are providing care for individuals. I um, have uh, mentioned I'm a professional counselor, so I abide by the American Counseling Association Code of Ethics. This is a requirement in the Code of Ethics, is that is evidence to suggest that um, the what I am using, the strategies I am using as a counselor come from a reliable evidence base. What I really like about this definition is that it's also fairly broad of how we understand evidence base. So certainly there are randomized clinical trials that exist highlighting um, some strategies and why those strategies are beneficial. And I think it's also important to remember that um, there's the evidence base isn't just um, being the number one uh, randomized clinical trial, um, that there's a lot of peer support research that exists, I'm sorry, peer reviewed research that exists for treatment models, which might not be um, as easy to study as some of the treatment models that exist in our world. So there is also, according to this definition, that we need to account appropriately for the individual sitting across from us. And that is part of working from an evidence-based model. I very much appreciate that as a clinician because I know that there are um, procedures for me if I'm working, especially from a manualized version, but that I, I'm not just a robot doing that. I am also a human um, that has been trained clinically, and I can infuse those clinical skills based upon the person sitting across from So just a, a lot of, um, I guess, I have strong opinions about evidence-based practices, which I bet is coming across here, um, but just some of, I, I hopefully it's just helpful to share a little bit about that. Um, I do, really, we can think about evidence-based practices um, being broken into almost two domains here, um, and that also overlap. So again, it's like a Venn diagram. We have pharmacological treatments. We also have psychological treatments, and at times those are used in conjunction. Um, so some pharmacological treatments, which you may have heard of, um, but some specifically are disulfiram, which is um, for alcohol use disorders. We also have naltrexone. We have methadone buprenorphine and suboxone. And suboxone is a combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. So these are medications that individuals can, um, that are prescribed um, and they are consumed that help them based upon the uh, substance that they are, that what the substance, what that medication is targeting, which substance that medication is targeting. So different um, receptors in the brain, whether it's occupying those so that a uh, substance when ingested isn't able to have the same effect um, or causing like a, bio, a biological um, action if the medication is consumed. So these pharmacological treatments are really important for us to understand um, and also think about how we can help advocate for um, expanding access to these pharmacological treatments. Uh, the Partnership to End Addiction, which is a um, national organization that provides a lot of information about advocacy, they um, have done, they do a lot of work, um, at least from my perspective that I have seen, of helping, helping think about how we can expand access to these pharmacological treatments. Um, so that's one kind of area that I would like to just recommend, or not area, but one organization that if you are interested in learning more about how we can help expand access to these pharmacological treatments, it's there. These are also growing potentially. Um, so I know one of the really surprising research for me, someone who has been trained as an alcohol counselor or an addiction counselor um, is the rise of psychedelics um, and use like psychedelics to treat addictive disorders. 
Um, I think that there, I have a lot of questions about that as someone who is um, an addiction counselor, um, but we are seeing that there are some promising results coming out of clinical trials for that. So I do think our pharmacological treatments are going to continue to evolve over time. Um, we also know that some of those um, medications used to treat uh, type 2 diabetes are also, um, so with like the Ozempic, um, is we're finding that individuals who are prescribed that are reporting um, decreased desire to consume alcohol. Um, so more, we're going to continue to learn more about these pharmacological treatments. Psychological treatments that are evidence-based, there are a wide amount of these. Um, some ones that stick out to me are behavioral couples therapy, certainly cognitive behavioral therapy, a wide evidence base to suggest that. Um, contingency management, which involves systematically reinforcing abstinence in some way. Um, motivational interviewing, this is also known as motivational enhancement therapy in the research literature. I am a huge proponent of motivational interviewing, and a lot of the reason for that for me is that um, Miller in his early, well, Miller and Rolnick, but Miller has written extensively about um, how the influence that Miller had with motivational interviewing and giving a lot of the credit to that to the Dr. Carl Rogers. So Dr. Carl Rogers, the founder of person-centered counseling. And I, as a counselor, have been trained in person-centered counseling. That's um, a lot of what we train our counselors on. Um, and that, that to me, really carries through in the work that Miller and Rolnick have done with motivational interviewing, but really focusing on the individual sitting across um, from you. And then also 12-step facilitation uh, therapy. Um, so that is a manualized version of integrating 12 steps into treatment. Um, that is many treatment programs across the U.S. use this 12-step facilitation model or, or similar models to that. I know I'm um, getting low on time, but a few, I wanna cover a little bit about um, harm reduction. Um, so this comes from Harm Reduction International, which is an organization. There's a few different um, harm reduction um, organizations. This is one that I just appreciate their um, information. And I know it might be hard to read with the black on the red screen, so I'll read that for you. Um, but the definition of harm reduction is that it refers to policies, programs, and practices that aim to minimize the negative health, social, and legal impacts associated with drug use, drug policies, and drug laws. It is grounded in justice and human rights. It focuses on positive change and working with people without judgment, coercion, discrimination, or requiring that people stop using drugs as a precondition of support. These are some of the services and practices of like associated with a harm reduction philosophy. Um, so providing information about how to use drugs safer, um, offering drug consumption rooms. These are also called overdose prevention centers or supervised consumption sites, um, needle and syringe programs in order to turn in used needles and syringes to prevent the spread of um, illness. Um, overdose prevention and reversal, I think, um, Many of us know about Narcan and the um, powerful um, use of Narcan to help reverse um, overdoses. And there's also um, other services that I won't go into detail here. Um, I know harm reduction services and these practices listed here often um, elicit a strong response from folks. Um, and this is all this is very much the case if you yourself have struggled with addiction and or have been affected um, by somebody else's um, use. I encourage you to lean into that discomfort and maybe learn a little bit more about these services and to understand how or understand what the research shows to see how these can be beneficial even though they are um, different <laughs> than abstinence-based models. So I lean into that discomfort um, and explore some of the research that um, supports these services and practices. The last item that I want to mention, because I would be remiss if I did not talk about peer support groups um, in this, is this idea of the community um, that exists out in the world for individuals. So peer support groups are also known as self-help groups or mutual aid groups or mutual help groups. Um, these serve a very important role in helping clients find recovery and as an adjunct to treatment. 
Um, these are often um, affiliate like the 12 step organizations, so AA, NA, um, but there are also 12 step organizations, like al alternatives that exist to those. Um, so Women for Sobriety, a Smart Recovery, those are just two that stick out to me. It's important that you as a counselor are familiar with a group and um, being curious about what group might be the right fit. Um, I do encourage you to do some um, learning about the different groups, the philosophies that exist, but also to learn your local community. So um, I know in one community that I lived in, um, I was um, I had contacts with the main office in the area, and I could ask about their knowledge of what groups were just different in different ways. So what groups might be great for beginners or what groups might be um, really appropriate open groups for um, individuals curious about learning more to attend. Um, so kind of learning about your local community in order to make those referrals, but also learning about um, your client and being like who your client is and to understand which um, might be the most appropriate referral to make to them. And also um, just emphasizing that the testing out different meetings can be incredibly helpful. I think uh, one, one great thing that has happened over the past four years, which was a significant need that we had um, during the height of COVID um, was the um, transitioning of groups to be online. So there are many more um, accessible meetings that individuals could find on an hourly basis due to having worldwide access to these. So, um, peer support groups are an incredible resource that exists in our community for folks. And it's really important for us to understand the lay of the land um, in our local communities that we may be referring our clients to. So with that, I know I am just a few minutes over, um, but I will um, transition to some questions that y'all might have, um, Hillary. Absolutely, we do have a few. The first question, um, the first two questions actually have to do with uh, the screening tools, and they just want to know, um, do you ever use the SASI, and um, do you use any measures of response style? I'm, I'm not sure the second question, what um, those individuals need, the measures of response style, but I, um, I have used the SASI previously, but I largely um, have not because of the work that I have done, um, really focusing on the um, I, the audit is honestly the one that I have used the most. And when um, the, when drugs were present, I would use the DAST. Um, so the SASE is, uh, I mean, there's a large evidence base behind that, um, but personally that's not been the work that I have done. And then, yeah, I'm not sure what the second part of that, or the second question about the measures of response style, which I'm guessing is largely um, tied into the, the specific assessment and understanding how an individual like responds to the specific type of question. Um, but that would be part of the training that you would receive on a specific assessment tool. Um, I have a clarification on that. They okay, great. Response style, I mean measures that take into account person minimizing or over-reporting. Absolutely. The thing that pops out to me is with that, um, so in my work, so audit, the audit number nine is have you ever, or have you experienced injury as a result of your drinking? I would have individuals sitting in a hospital bed or laying in a hospital bed with two broken legs and potentially numerous other injuries. And their blood alcohol level, level at the time of admission was like a point, uh, point two four, which is significantly higher than a point zero eight um, legal limit. Um, and I would have individuals who would respond, no, that they have never been injured as a result of that. Um, as a clinician, I'm not challenging that at that moment in time, but I'm making a note of it and I'm going to revisit that um, after I complete the, assess the uh, screening tool with that individual. So I'm going to circle back to that um, when I am exploring what it was like to go through that with me. Um, there are also um, these sorts of um, questions built in um, with some of the screening tools that exist. Thank you for that. The next question is, how do you decide between harm reduction versus abstinence treatment method? Great question. Um, and I think you ask your client, um, not just asking the client, but involving um, clients in the collaborative treatment process. We need to do that. Sometimes though, the treatment program will 
dictate this, um, that a harm reduction will not be appropriate or approved. Um, so again, that's where I, as a counselor, I want to make sure that my philosophy of working with individuals really is consistent with what the program is. Um, but then once I, once I am consistent, I will ask client, like, what do you, what are your goals, um, for the end of this? What is your goal for the end of treatment? What does that look like for you? Um, and helping explore, um, what those goals are to be able to see, is this more abstinence? Or is this um, potentially harm reduction? And I'm going to engage in that collaborative process with the client um, to help uh, get me, uh, get us to what that treatment plan is for them, which isn't just coming from me. And it's not only coming from them, but it's really this um, joint partnership to develop that. Thank you. The next question is, I'm interested in what alternative support group you would suggest for a client who is adamantly against the religious aspect of typical 12-step groups? This is often um, a pushback. This is one of the biggest um, the biggest concerns that individuals have with 12 steps. Um, so there are some, some uh, alternatives. I am a big fan of the SMART Recovery Program. I also, though, very much love um, for us as clinicians to really learn more about 12 step um, and learn about learn about the origins of this. So there um, you can read, um, I think it's chapter four, um, it's We Atheists in the big book. Um, and it really talks about um, it, AA is not a religious organization. But that does not mean that there's not a religious flavor to this. And that religious flavor is different based upon the different meetings that you go to. Um, so I absolutely understand that there are individuals who have some religious trauma in which going to a meeting and hearing the Lord's Prayer um, feels incredibly difficult for them. There are also other 12-step um, meetings that do not have that same flavor, but still follow the 12 steps. So I, I guess it's it's um, there are absolutely these alternatives that exist. Uh, smart recovery um, is one of them that I, I I very much appreciate, and it's also like learning a little bit more about the origins of twelve step um, to helpful hopefully help us do some psychoeducation or help clients explore. Um, different meetings that exist in our community, which might not have that same level um, of uh, religious flavor to it. Um, and that's a great question uh, to explore about learning about your local community, um, learning about the different meetings that exist. You can have the same meeting um, in the same, or a meeting in the same building, but the five o'clock meeting is very different from the seven o'clock meeting. Um, so understanding those differences um, and the nuances associated with that can be really helpful too. Thank you. We have several questions coming in on that same topic. Um, so just making sure we cover everything um, on in the topic of referrals, what measures do you take to ensure there are adequate religious and cultural considerations? So I know you kind of just spoke on that, but I didn't know if you have anything additional. Um, I mean, I love this question. I think this is a really, um, <laughs> we could literally spend five, well, many, many hours um, talking about this topic just in general. Um, as a counselor, I really appreciate the addressing model, which covers different domains um, of cultural identities. So I will take into consideration these different domains and others that might not be um, in the addressing model, just to think about who is the person sitting across from me. And then also how, how are the referrals I'm making consistent or not consistent with that identity for that individual? So being aware that um, we could potentially cause harm by making an inappropriate referral or suggestion based upon the individual's identity, um, but bringing that into the room. So not only am I being curious about the individual's identity sitting across from me, I'm also thinking about my identities, um, my identities that I bring into the room and how those um, those go together and are uh, not, you know, that are not similar, um, but being aware that Culture, culture matters um, and that culture influences um, experiences of uh, treatment um, and being very aware of just the variety of cultural identities, not just thinking about gender or race, um, certainly thinking about those, but also thinking about um, expanding on that. Um, so if I'm working with a client who is working about gender, 
if I'm uh, working with a client who's non-binary and we are making a referral to a residential program, I'm definitely going to want to ask what, how do they handle um, non-binary, non-binary, non-binary clients, especially because often residential programs are broken into male and female um, living or sleeping situations. Um, so I would want to know what that's going to be like for my client. Now, maybe that will still be an appropriate referral. We can talk with them about what that would look like, but I want my client to be involved in that process. I don't want them showing up and being surprised by that. Uh, but we also might be able to find a, um, tar- a tailored treatment program, which takes into account that specific identity for that individual. Um, so I'm hopefully answering that question just to say, I am certainly taking that into account thinking through who is this person sitting across from me? What are their identities? What do my identities sit in the room with them? And what does that mean for um, where I might be referring them to? Thank you. Along the same lines of that, um, to your knowledge, are any of the tools known to be more or less with culturally diverse groups? So there, um, this is one of, this is some of the information that is included in that repository is it will highlight what, uh, where, what populations has this been normed on. Um, so that is something, I won't go into the specifics of like each assessment that we've talked about today, but I encourage you to look up the origins of assessments. So it's important for us as uh, mental health counselors that we understand where has this been um, nor what population has this been normed on and studied, and then understand how that um, influence, how that is consistent or not consistent with the person sitting across from me, and then making a decision whether this is an appropriate assessment tool. Um, so digging into the um, original literature of the um, assessment is something that we um, absolutely need to do to understand if the um, it is appropriate to be administering that um, based upon the cultural identity of the person sitting across from us. Thank you. Are there any assessments you recommend for behavioral addictive disorders? So um, thanks for that question. One of the first that was developed, I believe it was in the 90s, it was developed by Patrick Carnes. So Patrick Carnes is a a renowned scholar about sexual addiction, um, and he developed the tool Pathos. Um, Pathos is an instrument, but it's P-A-T-H-O-S. Um, and that is a tool that was specific for sexual addiction. Um, but I believe, I'm not sure if it has been modified for other behavioral addictions or not, but the questions potentially could be. Um, but again, I'm not sure what the psychometrics associated with that would be um, if we all, if we made those changes. But that is one that sticks out. Um, there are some others for gambling addiction. There is a, and gambling addiction is the only behavioral addiction that is in the DSM-5 currently um, in, in terms of a diagnosable disorder. Um, and there are some uh, organizations that exist that could help uh, give you more information about that. So you can look, I believe there's a national, oh, I'm blanking on the name, but an, uh, Gambling Counselors Association, I forget the exact um, name of that organization, but you could find that uh, via a quick Google search. Thank you. Just a couple more questions here. Um, research shows that some people get better without alcohol treatment. Are there times that you would not refer to a program or treatment? Yeah, I mean, there's, so research not only shows this, but we have we have a we have a whole bunch of people who have never sought treatment and who have recovered um and also known as spontaneous recovery um and we we don't have research on those folks because they um but most of the time we don't have research on those folks i think there are some um qualitative studies on that experience but um there are definitely times in which I would not make a referral to treatment. So, and that was, that happened when I worked at the hospital. Um, some of that was access to treatment. Um, so being able to afford what that looked like, um, we're being able to afford that, or maybe there were limitations associated with family responsibilities. Um, I would emphasize with those folks um, that this is what my recommendation is, that I do think an IOP program at least would be um, incredibly beneficial for you. And here are the numbers for the assessment teams that can help do your intake and um, find out if this is an appropriate service. But also let's talk about changes that you could make on your own. And that's where I would utilize um, motivational interviewing um, and really think about harm reduction. So um, I hear that you're drinking, you know, 12 beers a night. What would that look like for you to cut back to nine? Um, Is that something that you would be open to doing? So you can see that that's my harm reduction philosophy that is being integrated into my clinical work. Um, It's not saying you are 
drinking 12 beers a night. Um, let's get, let's get you to zero. Um, I do not believe that that is uh, the best way to help an individual. Um, and I want to help them find successes that they can build on over time. They might build on these successes to get to zero, but they also might get build on these successes to stay at maybe it's two uh, beers a night that they end up getting to and they find that that's sustainable for them and not causing negative consequences. So there's a variety of different ways in which um, we can work with an individual that doesn't necessarily just referring to one of those levels of care um, or an advanced level of care than where we are meeting them. Thank you. We do have one question left. Given the low success rate of AA, do you recommend the program? It is particularly ineffective for women and people of color as well. Can you speak about medic medication assisted treatment in the U.S.? Um, so two different questions there. Um, I think I, for AA specifically, I want to talk about that with the person sitting across from me. Um, while there are so many people who have benefited and continue to benefit from 12-step programs, I do not want to take that away from someone who might find benefit from that just by saying, um, that research doesn't support this. I think there is research that also does support that. But again, I'm not making a broad statement. I'm not saying that this is the only thing, but I want to explore what is it going to be like for you to go into this or what would this look like? And because I know about alternatives to that, I am going to also highlight that there are these other organizations that exist. Um, so certainly ways in which I will... Um, ways in which I will really take into consideration the person sitting across from me and then integrate that with my knowledge that I have about these different support programs um, and being aware of potential, like uh, you mentioned in the question, potential harms that could be based upon a certain identity. Um, the second part of that question was medication assisted treatment. Um, so certainly um, medication assisted treatment is uh, phenomenal, um, provides a lot of benefits for individuals who are able to have access to that. I do think there are some questions associated with access that our country needs to explore um, in terms of who is able to get those medications, who's not, what are the limitations associated with uh, medication access. Um, there are also some harms that exist about for individuals who are utilizing medications, either medication assisted treatment or um, uh, like uh, medications, psychopharmacological medications. Um, and how those individuals are messages that they are hearing in potential 12-step meetings. Um, so there's often the belief that those individuals are not then in recovery if they are using uh, medication-assisted treatment. Um, and I really pull on um, that, I, I guess for me, it's this idea from DBT of like two things can be true at the same time. You can find a lot of um, benefits from this 12-step meeting. You can also find that not everything in that is for you. Um, that you using methadone um, and being involved in a methadone treatment program is one of the aspects that you are um, relying on for your recovery. And that goes hand in hand with this, but they're not, they don't, it's not, it's not, I'm, it's not a complete buy-in to every single thing. And that's just something I want to talk about with the person who's sitting across from me is to understand um, what is, what's your understanding of this and how does this impact you personally? And then how can we um, really just work collaboratively with this?